Welcome to the sixth lecture of our natural disasters course. In this lecture, we continue looking at volcanism. Our last lecture, we, we discussed volcanism in the context of plate tectonics and the, the mechanism that magma plays in the volcanic eruptive process. In this lecture, we're going to look at more of the human aspect. Um, we are going to look at several different case histories of volcanic eruptions. And uh, in those case histories, we're going to see ways in which uh, death and destruction may have been avoided. And also look at the different ways in which volcanism proves hazardous to human populations. So this graph has a record of volcano fatalities from about 15, the year 1500 to the year 2000. So during that time period, 275,000 people were killed uh, during this 500 year time period. And most of those people were killed by a handful, about a dozen volcanic processes. And so you can see on the y-axis, we have cumulative fatalities, and on the x-axis, we have time. And you see that the number a number of fatalities, oh, sorry, I don't think my pen is working here. There we go. Number of fatalities stays relatively constant, and then it jumps up in a handful of events. Uh, and these are, large killer events, these these steps in this plot. So you see most of the deaths are are due to a handful of very lethal volcanic events. So the hazards of volcanism include lava flows, pyroclastic flows, lahars, ash fall, poisonous gas emissions, and climate change, and part of climate change is indirect famine. Some of these we we discussed in the previous lecture, but we're going to look a little, uh, at them a little bit more in this lecture. So lava flows, as we said in our last lecture, this hazard is, is most common in shield volcanoes that erupt the basaltic lava that has a low viscosity and therefore can flow far distances before cooling. Also mentioned that it's not a significant threat to life, but it is the property because you know, we can't move roads, bridges, and houses in time to move them out of harm's way. And here is an image of a lava flow flowing into a village. One form of mitigation is you could dig ditches to try to divert the lava from around structures or build barriers like levees to kind of guide the lava flow in an in another direction, so it, it um, is harmless. Pyroclastic flows, we mentioned, is the mixture of pyroclastic material, mostly fine ash, with gas. And during an eruption, these pyroclastic flows take the form of super hot, high speed, turbulent clouds of ash. And they can kill thousands of people in one event. They travel very quickly, it's very hot, and it's it's very hard on the respiratory system. You can imagine just inhaling all that volcanic ash. It, it causes asphyxiation. Uh, so pyroclastic flows can occur from both uh, the volcanian phase of an eruption of a stratovolcano, the initial blast can trigger a, a pyroclastic flow, it often does, and also the planean phase um, as the eruptive column then collapses, it can flow down the flank or side of the volcano as a pyroclastic flow as well. And, and infamous, besides, you know, we all know Pompe uh, Pompeii that was destroyed by a pyroclastic flow. But another infamous pyroclastic flow was Mount Pele, uh, which erupted on the island of Martinique in 1902. So <clears throat> most pyroclastic flows they form from hot ash and gas overspilling the crater. Uh, few dead, the few, few deadliest pyroclastic flows are generated by 
direct blasts uh, from from an eruption. Right, so you can have you can have pyroclastic flows that occur without an eruption, right? And that's actually most pyroclastic flows. But uh, whenever there is an eruption, there is the largest, most powerful pyroclastic flows, and they are usually responsible for the most deaths. So here we can see in this image, this is Mount Pele, is the crater. And this is the flow of the uh, uh, path of the pyroclastic flow. You can see in this flow path is the city of St. Pierre, which is the capital of the nation of Martinique. I forgot to mention that Martinique, Martinique is in the, in the Caribbean. Well, so in 1902, there was a smaller pyroclastic flow that initially occurred and killed 40 people and raised tension. But the mayor of St. Pierre, then the town of population 25,000, used militia to prevent people from leaving because there was an upcoming election. And so an enormous Noi um, Ardente, which is, uh, means glowing clouds, what they called these pyroclastic flows, enveloped the town and killed all but two residents. So th this is an example of these people that they, they a smaller event, a smaller pyroclastic flow put them on alert they wanted to leave, but the, I guess the short-sightedness and selfishness of one person put all these people's life at risk and eventually cost them their lives. So obviously, you know, and today, hopefully nothing like this would ever be allowed to happen, but it just shows that sometimes if, uh, you know, the wrong decisions made by a few people can be very costly. So another pyroclastic flow in the eruption of Krakatoa in Indonesia in 1883, we mentioned this eruption in the last lecture, referring to the collapse of the stratovolcano in the form of caldera. There was a blast on August 27th that generated a pyroclastic flow. Uh, it flowed across the sea, um, which uh, it's a small strait, small uh, segment of water between Krakatoa and the island of Sumatra. And so the pyroclastic flow flowed across the strait and hit the shores of Sumatra and killed more than 2,000 people. This is a video of a pyroclastic flow. Uh, so as I said, pyroclastic flows do not have to occur with an eruption. They can occur anytime pyroclastic debris or ash gets stirred up and it flows down the side of the volcano under the force of gravity. The pyroclastic flow in this video is one that occurs without an eruption. So you can see as this pyroclastic flow came out of the valley, you see the wind blowing from, from left to right begins to carry the, the ash, the pyroclastic material to the right. Now, if this was a pyroclastic flow as a result of eruption, it would have traveled much more quickly. The gas would have been extremely hot and it would have come down much more violently and, and, and um, continued in that trajectory towards the camera. So, uh, though they are different, pyroclastic flows with or without an eruption, they are still just as hazardous without an eruption. Because if you imagine if you get caught in that cloud of debris, there's no way of breathing. 
which makes them so lethal. So lahars, which is an Indonesian term, are another volcanic hazard we briefly mentioned in our last lecture. Uh, lahars are when the pyroclastic debris that we see in pyroclastic flows, but rather mixing with gas or air, it mixes with water. And so water flowing down the hill of a volcano, water can come from multiple sources. It can be rain, it could be the melting of an ice cap. It mixes with the power across the debris and it creates these large mud flows. So in, in, in Indonesia, examples of lahars in 1586 and 1919. So the power across the material on the slopes of the volcano, it quickly decomposes in the fertile soil in tropical climates, which brings people to live on the slopes of the volcano, which we discussed. The water in the summit of the, of the crater, in, 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 the cra um, in the summit crater, it's sometimes forced out by uh, a resurgent dome in the crater, or maybe some, some gas erupts out and, and, and brings some, some of the uh, water out with it. But anyways, if that water kind of flows out of the crater, and begins to flow down the flank of the volcano. It mixes with the pyroclastic material that has been deposited on the side of the volcano and creates a lahar. So lahars can flow very fast and they can travel tens of kilometers from the volcano. Another example is Nevado del Ruiz in Colombia in 1985. It's a very high altitude volcano. It's topped with an ice cap. Uh, in the initial Planean eruption, it sent pyroclastic debris falling down onto the ice cap, which melted it. And the meltwater mixed with the pyroclastic debris on the flank of the volcano, causing a lahar that flowed downhill, killing 1,800 people. Later eruptions, they melted more ice, creating larger lahars, finally reaching the town of Omero, which had 27,000 residents, killing all but 5,000 of them. And so these lahars were a repeat of an 1845 event when a thousand people uh, were killed in the area. And there, there are fewer, fewer, fewer people living there at the time. So here's an illustration of where Armero was. And so the lahars flowed down to these river valleys and destroyed the city. So you can see a picture of the lahars that flowed down these river valleys coming out of the down from the volcano. So here's a picture of the volcano satellite image. You can see the ice cap. So this ice and snow melts and mixes with the pyroclastic debris below it as a ripe for lahars. And these are lahar paths, these red shaded regions, these historical uh, mud flows of lahars. And you can see uh, the one in uh, 1985 that destroyed the town of Romero and cost many lives. So Mount Rainier in Washington state also poses a significant lahar la la threat. Uh, and it's because the volcano is, is very high, has reaches to a great altitude, which that why it's concerned because the higher and steeper the volcano is, the more momentum the, the lahars will have, therefore coming down from the uh, mountain and the further they'll travel. It has an extensive glacial cap, which is a large source of water for the lahars. Frequent earthquakes, which means that the magma is active and the magma doesn't have to erupt, it just has to move close enough to the surface to melt the ice, to trigger lahar. And also has many active hot water spring systems. Um, suggesting that there is magma very close to the surface. It is a very, a very dynamic uh, volcano. So the, the mountain may, might, may fail in a massive avalanche and or uh, melted ice may cause floods or lahars without, even without an eruption. So Mount Rainier is, is a concern even without, like most volcanoes, an eruption. Historically, the Osceola, uh, Osceola sorry, Mud flows 5,600 years ago spread more than 120 kilometers from the mountain and over an enormous area. The area is now densely populated. So you can see this is that Osceola mud flow. It flowed down 
these river valleys and then out into this floodplain. And you can see now there are several towns in this region. So if this event occurs again, the people that live in these regions are in harm's way. So these are videos of Lahars uh, captured in Japan. So part of the Lahar detection system is they put closed circuit cameras um, focused on river valleys coming down from the volcanoes because as you said, Lahars can occur even without an eruption. It could be magma moving near the surface, melting ice, um, or it can even be a large rainstorm. Um, that triggers a lahar. So oftentimes the only warning is of a lahar is a visual sighting of a lahar. So they have these cameras that are constantly focused on these river, channel, uh, river, river channels, river valleys uh, along the base and up the slopes of the mountain and people are monitoring them. Um, so if there is a lahar sighting, there might be some time to evacuate populations further down, down river. Water itself is very powerful. It uh, has a lot of mass that gives it a lot of momentum. So there's not much that can stand in the way of moving water. Now, if you add pyroclastic debris to that, that adds even more mass to it, which makes it even more powerful. And you can really get the sense of the power in these videos. It's my favorite one. If you pay attention to this general region, eventually you'll see this large boulder just being tossed. And it really gives you an idea of right here is that boulder of the force behind these lahars. So asphalt is another hazard associated with volcanism. We talked about the massive uh, asphalt associated with Yellowstone briefly in our last lecture. Uh, 10, 10 million years ago, the central interior part of North America was very similar to the savanna of Africa today. Um, you know, grasslands, not, not far off of from what, uh, what, what it actually is today, but a little bit, a little bit warmer, at least at the beginning, um, <clears throat> Cenozoic. So, but there's migrating wildlife that would gather around watering holes. There, the Yellowstone erupted, the Yellowstone volcano erupted 1300 kilometers away and blanketed what is now part, uh, what is now Nebraska. This is just part of the ash fall. But this location, particular location, this particular location, Nebraska, was covered with you know 30 centimeters of volcanic ash. So this volcanic ash is very tiny. There are very sharp pieces of glass and rock. And as I've mentioned, they're very dangerous to inhale. So these animals, these large migrating animals in this prehistoric North America, they were basically asphyxiated, right? They were breathing in this, this ash. What happens is the ash displaces the oxygen, reducing the oxygen intake, and only that, but the ash, the 
because it's rough, it, it scours the, 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 um, the, uh, the interior of the lungs, reducing their ability to perform gas exchange and, and um, absorb oxygen from the air. However, these animals that perished, they were very well preserve, preserved in the ash after their death. And so it created this large uh, mass grave. And the fossils are excavated in what's called uh, the Ash Fall Fossil Beds Historical Park, which is in the Nebraska. You can see in this image the, um, the skeletons of these, these mammals 10 million years ago. So here's an illustration of what this water hole might have looked like. We have woolly rhinoceroses, you know, early horses and some camels and, and some you know, the elephant family. And uh, so this is the Yellowstone volcano and these three shaded regions are the ash falls from three different eruptions. The Lava Creek ash fall is the largest one of the three, it was 600 million years ago. The Mesa Falls ash bed 1.3 million years ago and the Huckaway Ridge ash fall 2.1 million years ago. You see all three of them cover a very large region with volcanic ash, much larger than the eruption of Mount St. Helens, which was the Strata volcano in 1980. So another eruption of Yellowstone, even if it's the size of the 1.3 million year old eruption, it'd still be a very devastating event burying multiple states in volcanic ash. Then there is the invisible hazard of volcanoes, which are poisonous gas emissions. So volcanic gases include carbon uh, monoxide and carbon dioxide, both very dangerous because they are odorless. Sulfur dioxide, you know, if there's sulfur dioxide in the air, it smells like rotting eggs. Uh, an example of poison gas emissions uh, being lethal is the Killer Lakes of Cameroon in Africa. So there's the East African Rift Valley, which is a uh, failed rift with uh, large craters, volcanic craters on it. Lake Nyos is, is, is it's a young lake with the noise craters. Um, it's in a high crater formed by an explosion, a volcanic explosion a few hundred years ago, and it, the crater of the lake was formed from the crater filling in the rainwater. Well, 1986, a large volume of gas burst out of the lake and it flowed down uh, into the valley uh, and the layer of gas is about 50 meters thick and it flowed up to 45 miles per hour. It doesn't really matter the speed because it flowed down at night while people were sleeping. So four villages were overwhelmed by the cloud of gas. Now this, this gas was carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And so uh, basically these people perished the same way people die from carbon monoxide poisoning today. It's an odorless gas which fills up the, um, the air and it basically displaces the oxygen. And so you get less and less oxygen and you slowly lose consciousness. Um, so only four awoke um, after they lost consciousness. Uh, 1,700 people were killed, 3,000 cattle died and all the local wildlife died. So anything that basically breathed oxygen and that was close to the ground um, died. So as I said, the gas is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is in the air all around us, but um, it's there's still plenty of oxygen in the air for us to breathe. So if you add too much carbon dioxide, as it as it says, it takes it takes the place of the oxygen if there's too much carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon dioxide is a heavier molecule than oxygen. It's a carbon and two oxygens. Where oxygen is, oxygen is two oxygen. So in large concentrations, it's heavier. So it actually hugs the ground. And so it pushes the oxygen up further away from the ground. That's how it displaces the oxygen. 
do too much carbon dioxide, it kills all the fauna, all the animals, but it does not affect the flora, the plants. So it's, you can imagine this eerie scene where you come to this region in, in Africa in the morning where all of the animal life and all of the people have perished, but seemingly nothing has happened. All the plants are still there. There's nothing appears different except it's silent and there's no animal life, no insects, and nothing, anything that breathes oxygen perish. So the carbon dioxide had leaked up from the basaltic magma under the lake. Um, this is part of the East African uh, failed rift, this volcanic line, and the lake water was stratified. The densest water was at the bottom, so the so the cold, dense water is at the bottom and the warm, less dense water is at the top. And this cool, dense water was absorbing this carbon dioxide. And it was kind of acting as a, as a, as a reservoir of this carbon dioxide. As this carbon dioxide um, escaped the magma, it was moving up and absorbing or dissolving into the water at the bottom of the lake. Well, eventually, there was so much dissolved carbon dioxide in the bottom of the lake that its density became uh, equal to or slightly less than the density of the water above it. So it became unstable. And the water overturned, where the water at the bottom moved to the top and the water at the top moved to the bottom. And as that water at the bottom moved to the top, the pressure was under decreased and all that CO2 began to bubble out, undissolve out. And so the CO2 burst out in these huge you know, bubbles and they begin to flow down the mountainsides as this, uh, as this dense cloud around the ground. About one third of the gas is left in the lake and more is continuously being added. So it takes about 20 years for the lake water to become oversaturated with CO2 again for this process to, to repeat itself. However, we've learned from this process and they have installed degassing pipes which now allows high pressure gas to escape from the bottom water of the lake before, uh, before it can build up to those levels where it becomes unstable and all escapes at once. So tsunami is another indirect hazard associated with volcanoes. So whenever there is a pyroclastic flow or a lahar or a landslide uh, at a volcanic island that hits the water near it that can trigger tsunami and also the collapse of, of the volcano or a lava dome which is basically the a plugged vent uh, the rock that plugs the vent is called a lava dome if that breaks and as a landslide was on that can trigger a tsunami and that happened uh, in 1883 where Krakatoa when we said it was a shroud volcano it erupted but then it collapsed forming a caldera and that collapse, um, it killed more than 36,000 people. So less than 10% of those deaths were directly due to the eruption. More than 90% were those deaths were caused by the tsunami induced by the collapse of the volcano. Then Mount Unzen in Japan in 1792, an earthquake triggered the collapse of a lava dome sending an avalanche or pyroclastic flow to the ocean. And when it hit the ocean, it displaced a large volume of water, creating a tsunami. And that killed 15,000 people on the other side of the, of the strait or the harbor uh, from, from, the, from the volcano. So here is, um, here is the, you know, the southern island of on the southern islands of Japan. And if you zoom in, you can see Mount Unzen is right here. The pyroclastic flow hit the water here, triggered a tsunami that made landfall on the other side, killing the people on this coast here. Then we have indirect famine. So Laki uh, was as an Icelandic volcano. It's a fissure eruption occurred in 1783. Uh, there's the greatest amount of lava eruption in, in historic times. 
So a fissure eruption is whenever the eruption, eruption is occurring through a crack, a long linear crack. Uh, it's because Iceland is along the divergent plate boundary. It's being pulled apart. And so the eruption usually in Iceland occurs along these fissures. Well, the, the eruption had uh, was erupting lava at a rate of 5,000 cubic meters per second, which is one third of the volume of the Mississippi River over 50 days. So there was a large volume of lava coming out and that was accompanied by an enormous amount of gas. Some of that gas being sulfur dioxide and fluorine, um, which that killed the livestock in the region. And as a result of the killing off the livestock, about 20% of the population died due to starvation. So here an example of indirect famine um, resulting from the volcano. Now that might not necessarily happen today because we have the ability to import food in at a much higher rate uh, more quickly, right? Or in 1783, a sudden loss of 20% to your food source to be extremely detrimental to the local population. The Mount Tambora in 1815, the most violent explosive eruption in the last 200 years. Had two extremely violent planane eruptions tore open the volcano so that 50 cubic kilometers of magma erupted into pyroclastic flows uh, over one week. So they reduced the uh, elevation of the mountain from 4,000 meters to 2,650 meters. So it almost halved the height of the mountain, that's how explosive this eruption was, and created a six kilometer wide, one kilometer deep caldera. So the eruption resulted in 117,000 deaths. 10% of those deaths were directly due to, directly from the eruption. 90% were from famine or disease um, that uh, ensued after the eruption. So after the pyrocrostic fallout, damage the crops. So this, this ash falls in the crops and it damages the crops and reduces the food supply. This eruption affected global climate so that 1816 was known as the year without a summer. Because all the um, sulfur dioxide and particulate in the, in the atmosphere, it scatters the sunlight. So not as much sunlight reaches Earth's surface, which lowers the temperature until that material settles out of the atmosphere. So the VEI, uh, Volcanic Explosivity Index of some killer eruptions, look at that. So does energy or the size or magnitude of the eruption correlate with the number of fatalities? So the VEI, as I said, is a semi-quantitative estimate of the magnitude of volcanic eruption using the volume uh, erupted and the eruption column height. However, as we've discussed, some deadly events rank very low on the VEI. The frequency of different VEI magnitudes, as with all natural disasters, is an inverse correlation. Eruptions that rank higher on the VEI index are less frequent. Those that rank lower are more frequent. And as populations grow, there are more and more people live in volcanic hazard zones. So even these low VEI events, they're very frequent. And if there's a large number of people living in these hazard zones, even though they might claim a small number of lives, they're very frequent, those lives could begin to um, add up over time. Mount Toba, it, as I mentioned, I referenced this in the previous lecture, uh, this eruption may have nearly driven human race into extinction due to the resulting climate change. Uh, this, you know, it might be a, it's a correlation, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily a causation. So the eruption was equivalent to 560 Mount Pinatubo eruptions, or Mount Pinatubo was one of the most explosive eruptions in modern times. So here you can see uh, Lake Neos, which we discussed with the uh, carbon dioxide gas. It, there was no eruption at all. There was just gas escaping at rank zero on the VEI. Nevada, Nevada del Ruas, that was the uh, Lahar flows in Colombia. That, that event came in as a three on the VEI. The pyroclastic flows in the island of Martinique due to, from Volcano Pele was a four. Eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980 was a five on the VEI. 
the 79 eruption of Vesuvius, the Krakatoa eruption in 1883 and Mount Pinatubo in 1991. That was ranked six. Mount Tambora, the seven. And Yellowstone, 600,000 years ago, or Mount Toba, 74,000 years ago, those rank as eight. So these are extremely large events. So we monitor volcanoes because, we, you know, unlike earthquakes, with earthquakes, a certain amount of strain has to accumulate on the fault for enough energy to be stored to result in a large earthquake. So we can use the seismic gap method and we can kind of have a, a ballpark idea of when an earthquake may occur. We can never predict it to the specific date or even the year, but we can say, hey, you know, there's likely gonna be an earthquake in the next 50, years. We can't do that with volcanoes. Volcanoes can go hundreds of years centuries without any sort of activity and then just erupt right and then erupt several times and then go inactive for for a couple years it's, it's 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 sporadic right that's what makes them dangerous so we have to constantly be monitoring volcanoes and so long valley california in 1982 there was abundant crustal melting there's no hot spot here um, this includes uh, including the colossal eruption of 760,000 years ago that created the uh, Long Valley Caldera that exists today in California uh, and erupted uh, pyroclastic debris that uh, deposited in layers hundreds of meters thick. So uh, 760,000 years ago, it was an extremely large eruption. Uh, and so this is a large continental caldera like Yellowstone. It has rare giant eruptions, but it has frequent small eruptions. Uh, it had one 600 years ago, and then a smaller one um, 200 years ago. So in 1982, oh, sorry, this is the uh, Bishop Tuff from the point uh, 760 million years ago, uh, 760,000 years ago, or 0.76 million years ago. That's how thick the volcanic ash was. But uh, going back to 1982, in 1980, a few weeks after the Mount St. Helens eruption, there was numerous earthquakes, including uh, four magnitude sixes. So Mount St. Helens erupted, volcanism is on people's minds. There are some earthquakes, earthquakes around volcanoes indicate that magma is moving, it's breaking new rock or moving into uh, already existing cracks. Um, and so that puts people on edge around this volcano. In 1982, a resurgent dome rose 25 centimeters. So that, so remember, a resurgent dome is basically the land, the rock over top of the magma chamber. It lifted up 25 centimeters, suggesting magma, more magma is moving into the chamber beneath it. The U.S. Geological Survey issued a notice of potential volcanic hazard, which is the lowest level of alert. As a result, housing prices dropped 40% and the tourism in the area, it diminished. The residents were extremely angry, especially considering that the volcano did not erupt. Fast forward to 1990s, uh, same area, Long Valley, California, the trees began to die on Mammoth Mountain in the region because CO2 was leaking from the underlying magma into the soil. Small earthquakes resumed, the ground surface began rising in the resurging dome. Volcanologists were hesitant to release an alert after the quote unquote false alarm in 1982, which it wasn't even a false alarm, it was just the lowest level of alert, just, you know, hey, this volcano is exhibiting some activity that's a little bit above the baseline level of activity. So just, you know, be, be aware of that. But uh, even that little bit of uh, information was enough to scare people. And so the volcanologists were hesitant. So they didn't, uh, they didn't issue any official statement as far as the uh, alert system. They just put out a public statement and told residents to prepare for the worst, but hope for the best. 
Uh, so that's that's the, that's the fine line that volcanologists they they walk, right? They are constantly monitoring these volcanoes, but you don't want to issue a warning unless you're absolutely certain a volcano is going to erupt. Because if you issue a warning, or even a watch, or even an alert, right? People will react to that, and that'll have an impact on the economy, the local economy. And if the volcano doesn't erupt, then you still have that impact on the economy, which you could say, well, at least the people are still alive, right? But, you know, people, people don't look at it that way. They look at it and they're like, well, you know, my, my house isn't worth as much. I lost part of my livelihood, my business, you know, or struggled. People understand, understandingly, so they, 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 that hurts them and they get angry, even though they could have potentially saved their life. Because if they would have erupted and they weren't in that area, or if they were ready to evacuate at a moment's notice and that saved their life, they would have been eternally grateful, right? But uh, it's just one of those things. It's a fine line that volcanologists walk. An example of a successful uh, volcanic eruption warning was in Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991. It was the largest eruption in the 20th century near a populated area. Nearly 1 million people, 20,000 of them being U.S. military personnel, were in the danger zone. After 500 years of quiet, the magma moved towards the surface, uh, resulting in thousands of small earthquakes and three small steam blast uh, craters and sulfur dioxide gas emissions were observed. An intense monitoring program uh, was underway by the U.S. and the Philippine scientists. Um, as a result, and on June 7th, the degassed magma reached the surface and formed a lava dome. June 12th, which is Philippine Independence Day, a large explosive uh, eruption began. And the evacuation cleared everyone out and closed the military base. On June 15th, there was a cataclysmic eruption. More than five cubic kilometers of magma and rock erupted up uh, 35 kilometers into the atmosphere. Pyroclastic flows covered the region 200 meters deep uh, in, in, in ash. And then to add injury to insult, a typhoon, which is what they call a hurricane on, on the Pacific coast, arrived and washed the volcanic debris down the slope of volcanoes and the Lahars. So only 300 people were killed, but millions of people were moved out of harm's way. 20,000 uh, estimated deaths would have occurred without the evacuation. $500 million of property was uh, saved, which include military aircraft. So the evacuation of this area uh, is an example of many lives saved. But as you can see, there was, there was a evacuation again once you know, some explosive eruptions were underway. So this evacuation could have been even too late if, if the process would have happened even faster and, and the cataclysmic eruption was on soon after June 12th and beyond later on June 12th or on the 13th. But those, that three day grace period probably made a big difference. So signs of impending eruption. So there's several phenomena the volcanologists look for um, when they're evaluating a volcano. And looking for signs of an impending eruption. Uh, and uh, these signs determine if it's rely, uh, if you know, we can justify an evacuation. So one of those signs is seismic waves. So magma rising towards the surface causes rock to break, which sends off short period seismic waves, high frequency seismic waves. Magma rising through open conduits, already existing cracks, sends off long period or low frequency waves. And for two weeks before, example, the Mount Pinatubo eruption, there were 400 long period events, which shows, shows magma is moving up into the, uh, some empty portions of the magma chamber. They were recorded from 10 kilometers deep. So those, those, those low period, long period events, sorry, were, were indicative of magma moving up into place for the eruption. Then there's ground deformation. As the magma moves up, it causes the ground to deform. As magma moves up from into one place from another, the ground could uplift in one place 
in, 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 in fall in another. So we measure ground deformation with kilometers, strain meters, distance from the satellites. So for example, the Three Sisters of Volcanoes, Oregon, it bulged upward 10 centimeters, has 21 million cubic uh, meters of magma rose up into the magma chamber. Then there's gas measurements. They measure the amount of gas emissions because as magma approaches the surface, it's under less pressure and it loses gas solubility and the gas begins to undissolve and escape. And so elevated levels of gas emissions, volcanic kind of gas emissions like uh, carbon dioxide, water vapor, or sulfur dioxide can be indicative of a pending, impending eruption. So CO2 from magma can kill trees in high concentrations. Uh, declining CO2 levels uh, have, you know, can re relieve worry sometimes. Uh, the Galeras volcano in Colombia, the decrease in gas emissions, in that case, relieved worries. However, the, uh, in this case, the volcano was plugged by some sticky magma, which cut off the gas emissions, but allowed for gas pressure to continue to build at depth. And um, the volcano later erupted, killing several volcanologists collecting data in, in that crater. So with all these different ways of monitoring a volcano, the seismic waves, ground deformation, and gas measurements, none of them are a a definitive sign of an eruption. They are just activity that we pay attention to that can suggest that there is going to be a large eruption. Theoretically, we could observe no elevated activity levels in these three areas and still have a large eruption. At the same time, we can have very, very elevated activity uh, in these three areas, seismicity, ground deformation, gas measurements, ultimately no significant eruption. So it's really tough. Uh, the United States has uh, volcano observatories. And uh, uh, in the 20th century, the, uh, the United States has had powerful eruptions in Alaska, California, Hawaii, and Washington. And there's at least 65 active or potentially active volcanoes in the US. And so, as I said, the US Geological Survey has established a volcano hazards program with five volcano observ observatories. And so you can click these links. These links go to all the different, the five different volcano observatories. Each have their own website and they report current activity. So for example, this is the Cascades Volcano Observatory. So the Cascade Volcanoes uh, observes this region here. Uh, these green triangles are active volcanoes, the Cascade Range. So these, these stratovolcanoes are the result of subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate under North America. This is the convergent plate boundary here. And uh, there are, um, uh, very high threat potentials, high threat potentials, moderate threat potentials, and then low to very low threat potentials. And if we if we can click on some of these, we say Mount Rainier. pulls up Mount Rainier uh, and we can look at a monitoring map. Which just shows us all the instrumentation in the region. So these black circles are, these black triangles are seismometers measuring the seismicity. These red objects are the tilt meters measuring the ground deformation and the stars are GPS measurements. So if you click on that, we can see the seismic activity in the region in the last 24 hours. It loads here. So here you can see um, the last each of these lines is a half hour. And so you have the 24 hours of recording. You can see all these little tiny events. Some of them are much larger, right? But remember we see many clusters of large events 
And if we see uh, through triangulating them, we see that those are they're occurring shallower and shallower. That suggests that magma is on the move and it's moving near the surface. And you see GPS data where this is This is uh, this graph is in meters, uh, and this is east uh, east west data. So positives moving east, negatives moving west. You can see it was moving west the surface, then it all of a sudden jolted east, and then it was slowly moving west again. So that slow drift westward that's probably just you know the motion of the tectonic plate, right? But then you see like these little sudden jerks within that, especially this one. Uh, and we look at the vertical, I don't see the vertical on here, this is the north, but the vertical is actually the more telling measurement because uh, the vertical, if it's moving up, that's the volcano kind of swelling uh, if magma is moving up into the volcano. So they often pay close attention to the vertical component of the GPS data. So there are different alert levels the US Geological Survey uses. So the green is normal. That's the typical background activity of a volcano in a non-eruptive state. So there's always gonna be seismicity. There's always gonna be some ground deformation and some gas emissions because it is an active volcano. Um, so some activity is normal and there's volcanologists know what is kind of typical for each volcano. Then yellow is an advisory. So there's elevated unrest above the known background activity. So increased seismic activity, increased ground def deformation and gas emissions relative to that volcano. Then you have a watch, which is heightened or escalating unrest with increased potential for eruptive activity or minor eruptor or minor eruption is underway. Then finally, we have red, which is a warning. So a highly hazardous eruption is underway or So these are hazard maps of Mount Rainier. Uh, next is uh, both Mount Rainier. But you can see these are Lahar hazard zones, these yellow. So these are, you can see the river valleys that extend from the volcano. So the pyroclast debris mixes with water and flows down these river valleys. And you can see there's some many populated regions in these Lahar hazard zones. And um, here's another image of these Lahar uh, zones, hazard zones. And they're quite extensive. They flow far from the uh, volcano, further than some might think, even down to these populated areas near Tacoma, Washington. So volcanoes can be hazardous with or without an eruption. And they are hard to predict when they will erupt or if they will erupt at all. So that's what makes them even more particularly hazardous. Now, fortunately, uh, when volcanoes do erupt, they, they, they don't kill as many people as hurricanes or, or large hurricanes or earthquakes do. So they're one of the less lethal natural disasters, but they are one of the most spectacular events to observe volcanic eruption. So that concludes this lecture. And thank you very much.